We are in the last of our summer reading series. Does it surprise any of you guys that summer is almost over? It's pretty amazing to me. It's like, wow, it's September. And it's the time just keeps marching on. We are inviting, I am inviting myself, actually, into learning how to live benevolently. Hard to say words sometimes. Benevolently. <laughs> I don't think I quite got it. But learning how to extend goodwill. The word benevolent, it comes from, it's derived from Latin, and it means goodwill and kindness. Part of whatever you call the higher power, God, source, divinity, Christ, whatever you call that, in almost every single religion, we're being invited into living in goodwill with each other, living in kindness with each other, and doing it universally. Benevolence is not something that's based on performance. It's not something that's based on behavior. It's not something that we give to somebody because they did a good job with something. Goodwill and kindness is what we're being called to give to each other in every moment. It's a given that's given no matter what's out there. Now that's easy for me to talk about, that's easy for me to say, it's easy for me to practice when I'm in a great mood. It's easy for me to practice with people I really love. It's a little bit more difficult, up to a lot more difficult, if I'm having a hard time with somebody, if I'm feeling challenged by somebody. It's more difficult, even with somebody I absolutely adore, if I'm triggered or mad, or if I'm scared, or if I'm feeling I'm not good enough. It's much more difficult for me to extend that goodwill. How about you guys? Is it easy for you, or can it be difficult? Oh, yeah. It can be easy and it can be difficult. One of the paradoxes of the both ands of life. So part of what we're going to be looking at is how do I learn to make it an everyday practice? And there's, if you know me very well, you know that one of the things I absolutely adore is asking questions. We have a brain that loves to analyze, that loves to process, to problem solve, to find solutions for something. And so one of my favorite strategies in my life is to give it a big problem to solve. And here are my two favorite questions. How do I live in harmony with myself? And how do I live in harmony with other people? It begins with me, right here, always. Because what's going on inside of me is going to be outpictured or outformed, or it's going to show up, whatever terminology you like to use going to show up on the outside. If I'm frustrated inside, there's a part of me that's going to be looking for that person who's going to set me off so I can let go of that frustration. You know, we call it a chip on our shoulder. So I might be walking around with a chip on my shoulder looking for somebody to knock it off, and then I can <laughs> release all that adrenaline that's pent up that I'm actually looking for a fight. But the truth is, I don't want to live looking for a fight. Try it on for a minute, just what that looks like. Ha! That's kind of the situation of it. Try it on. Ha! Ha! Do you notice the burst of adrenaline you get? But it doesn't last very long. Soon we're looking for a bigger ha, so we have to ha ha. Then we have to, ha, ha, ha. Then we have to get our machine gun out. And really, ha ha. ha. You know, we have to get it bigger and bigger and bigger to continue to get that adrenaline rush, because that's what we're looking for. Many of us are drawn to that drama. But when I'm asking myself the question, how do I live in harmony with myself, then I'm going to be seeking harmony with all. And when I'm not in harmony with myself, I'm going to notice the difference of how I behave and what I draw in. And how do I, and I don't know about you guys, but I can fight with myself, you know, this hand fights with this hand, and you know, this idea fights with this idea, and I want to do two things at once, or maybe three, or maybe four, or maybe five, and time is limited, and then I have to decide, and I might feel frustrated by it, or I might have this thought and this thought at the same time. So I can spin. You 
in my mind very easily. And then I have to bring myself back home to center and find the harmony within that spinning. And it's possible. And when I find the harmony in my own spinning, it's much easier to open up to the harmony when something out there is spinning. I can just sort of step back and say, hmm. It's one of my favorite phrases. It opens up the capacity of wonder. I'm going to invite you into it. Hmm. Yeah, it opens the brain space for wonder. I'm going to show you a meme. Does this look familiar to anybody? Yeah. <laughs> you may have seen it on Facebook. But this is kind of what life is often like. We have our expectations. Things are going to be wonderful. We're going to have such a great time. Everything's going to go smoothly. And then we have reality. And sometimes this is what inharmonics looks like inside of me, this side. So how do I begin to untangle the knots of error that bind me? when I'm over here? How do I begin to come back to center? Self-awareness is a wonderful thing, which is part of the, the entire message of the book that we've been studying called Living Originally. What are the things that set me off? Who triggers me the most? You know, the people that we're closest to are often the people that trigger us the most. And then how am I going to handle that? Because for me, the person I love the most, the person I live with the most, is the person I want to be most in harmony with. And so what do I need to do inside of myself? And what do I need to change inside of myself? And what do I need to open up to and embrace inside of myself so that I can live in that harmony with myself? with the person I love, with my best friends, in my job, in all parts of me. One of the best ways is to focus on my purpose, to seek out what is my purpose. When I extend goodwill and something happens, am I willing to leave that goodwill out there and live from it? Or am I going to reel it in, you know, like going fishing? Am I going to reel it in? How do I know I'm reeling it in? I'm in blame, I'm in judgment, I'm in criticism. It might be with me, but I might be directing it toward you. But that tells me something. You know, maybe I'm going to say, well, if you'd only said it to me differently. Well, if you hadn't used that tone of voice, I would have been able to hear you. Or, oh, please, I'm just going to leave in a 1947 Tudor house. I'm, you know, that's part of how we live in that disharmony. Or I could actually say to myself, hmm, what in me is triggered? Let me step back, hmm, and get curious. Let me go into wonder. Gay Hendricks is one of my favorite writers in all of the world, as well as one of my favorite people. He says, purpose is a powerful inquiry. If we ask sincerely from a place of wonder instead of justification, we can work miracles with the tiniest of shifts. When I go into wonder that, hmm, instead of, okay, you know, you said this to me, so now I get to say this to you. Okay, you were angry and raised your voice, so now I get to be angry and raise my voice. You yelled at me, so I have a right to yell at you. We can do that, or we can step back. We can wonder, wow. I wonder what's happening here. I wonder what I called in. What can I learn from this? How is this familiar from my past? I can ask myself those questions, and I can live in self-discovery. I want to tell you a story about a woman on a subway. It was a Monday morning. If you've ever been on a subway in New York on Monday mornings, they're kind of hectic. This woman was going to work. She's on her way. She gets on the subway because those doors have just opened up. It's very crowded, but there is one seat. It's right there. And then for that subway seat, it's mine. I'm going to sit down all the way to work. And boom, this woman comes out of nowhere, hits that woman, sits down. <laughs> well, here comes the match flare. Do you have one of those? Anger flares, tempers rise. One person starts yelling, the other person starts yelling, there's a big kaboom. 
What happens to harmony? And then we got to do adrenaline rush. And then I can say, well, it's okay if I yelled at her because, you know, she stole my seat. She took my seat. I was going to sit in that seat. And it might not be a subway seat for you. Maybe it's a job that you expected to get a raise at. Maybe somebody got the position that you wanted and you feel like you deserved it. Maybe it was a car accident where you saw them and they were paying no attention. Maybe they were texting or something. And we have this sense of whoosh that comes up into us and we feel justified in our anger. So we, we have reeled our goodwill back in. And yet, how do we feel? How do I feel when I yelled at you because I was in reaction instead of response? How do I feel when I have nagged you because I think you should do something that maybe you don't think you should do? How do I feel when I tell that story? Hey, do you know what happened to me on the subway? Oh man, do you know what happened to me on the subway? Let me tell it to you. And let me tell it to you again. And let me tell it to you again. And let me tell it to you again. So I might have spent the morning, I might have spent the day, I might have actually spent the week telling people about what happened to me and how justified I am in my anger. But my question is, what happened to my joy in that process? I wasted a week of joy because I was focused on my anger. I wasted a week where I could have been having a really good time because I didn't let go and I felt justified and I might not have known how to release it. I might not have known how to move myself into saying, wow, you know, I guess you wanted it more than me, <laughs> that seat. I might not have known how to say, Oh, I can let it go. I can stand. Another seat will open up. Or maybe this is good, you know, core exercise <laughs> on the subway. <laughs> I'm getting my exercise in this moment. Maybe I might not have known that it's okay to have the feeling, but I don't have to express it in a way that's harmful to another person. I might just say, oh, wow, I thought I was going to have that seat, and I'm, I'm a little discombobulated here. So, you know, bless you for having that seat. It's a hard thing to do. Unity's not for sissies, you guys. <laughs> it takes courage to reel the anger back in and to open the heart up and to be loved. It takes practice of telling myself I'm willing to extend goodwill and then doing it. And sometimes it takes practice beginning in the grocery store, beginning on the road. But when I'm willing to practice it with the little things, with the big things like the subway, for me when I lived in New York City, the subway was a big thing, getting a seat. When I can practice it with the little things, when I can outpicture the, the goodwill. But let me take it one step further, and for me, honestly, in many ways, this is the more difficult one. If I am disturbed by something, I was disturbable. I had some Velcro for something. And in highest consciousness, I really should send that one a thank you card. Thank you for showing me a place where I'm out of harmony or could easily be out of harmony with myself. That takes great courage. That takes incredible self-love and a sense of self-worth. Are you willing to see yourself? Am I willing to see myself as big enough, as loved enough, as courageous enough to do something different than adrenalize my anger? It can be an amazing thing. Challenging, but amazing. Eric Butterworth says, there is a flow of harmony and love everywhere. On the road, on the subway, on the bus, 
in our workplaces. There is a flow of harmony and love everywhere. Whether you're aware of it or not, that flow is still present. And whether or not you're consciously moving in it or not, the flow is still present. This is what the omnipresence of God means. There is no spot where God is not. There is only one presence and one power active in the universe. Am I consciously aware of being in that presence and power and living from that presence and power? Or am I over here in the tangle of my disharmony of life? The beautiful thing is that truly the decision is mine when I choose to take it. That's what responsibility is. The decision is mine when I choose to take it. No matter what happens out here, I can choose to come back over here to where the, the string is straight and live in harmony. Wow, I am willing to stay in my joy. I'm willing to stay in my peace. I'm willing to stay in my harmony no matter what happens. That takes some courage. And I believe that that's what we're called to do in spiritual community with ourselves first and with each other. I believe that this is what the master teacher, Jesus, is inviting us into. John 13, 34, in the voice translation says, and this is Jesus' words talking to his disciples. So I give you a new command. Love each other deeply and fully. Remember the ways that I have loved you and demonstrate your love for others in those same ways. Now it's easy to say, oh, you know, that was easy for Jesus. You know, he was just like that. It's easy for me to look at somebody else and say, wow, that comes so easily to you. I don't really know that, but that's one of the ways I get myself out of harmony with myself. But let me give you a little bit of backstory about what was happening with Jesus just before he spoke these words. Jesus and his disciples are in Jerusalem for Passover. Jesus knows that he's about to be portrayed. As a matter of fact, he's having dinner with the disciples and whoever else is there. And he says to them, one of you guys are going to betray me. And people are like, oh, no, no, teacher, no, that's not going to happen. And Jesus takes a piece of bread and he dips it in a cup of wine. And he holds it up and he hands it to one of his disciples, Judas of Iscariot. And he said, this is for you. Go and fulfill the scripture. He knew. Go and fulfill the scripture. It's that your job to do. And then he began to teach love. Love one another. And Jesus modeled that. He spent time, ate dinner with the tax collectors. He spent time with the prostitutes. He spent time with Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee. He spent time with people that sometimes other people looked at and said they were not worthy. But when we look at universal benevolence, everybody is worthy. It's a given. Everybody is worthy of respect. Everybody is worthy of love. Does that mean we have to take bad behavior from somebody? No. I don't like your tone of voice. I feel uncomfortable with what you're saying to me right now. Let me take a few moments because I know I'm getting triggered. Let me take a few breaths. I'll come back and talk to you in an hour. And maybe we can resolve this. We learn how to do it differently. Step by step, we learn in spiritual community. We learn with practice with each other. We learn where we can say to somebody, I don't know what to do. And instead of focusing on the story, focus on the solution. How can I live in harmony with myself first and with others? How can I face into what I feel like is somebody who's betrayed me and still extend that goodwill. That takes courage. And you are here today because you have that courage to live your life in harmony. 
to live your life in love, to live your life in peace, to live your life in joy, to go the road less traveled and do something different. If this is something that interests you, say this affirmation with me. Together, I choose to open my heart and to live in harmony with myself and others. If you're struggling with somebody today, if you've been struggling with somebody or something, some issue, we're writing prayers for World Day of Prayer. Put it on the prayer list. Because what we know, what I have lived, what many of you have lived, is that prayer changes things. And what it changes is what's inside of us. Being in that energy of love changes us. Write it down. Let your heart open up. And let yourself enjoy all of the joy that's available to you right here, right now, every day, in all ways. somehow don't have a prayer list, raise your hand. The welcome team will bring you one. We'll also bring you a pen. We're asking that you write this year in pen because when we're reading the names, pen is a lot easier to read than pencil. <laughs> oh, so hold up your hand if you need that. And as the welcome team comes around serving you, we're going to sing, I am opening, and then we'll go into a time of meditative writing.
more delicious harmonic. creativity of God resides in us. The faith of God resides in us. And with this practice, we have a renewed commitment to open, to open, to open, and to open yet again. Give us this day our physical and spiritual 